And last week, I started uh, into this uh, message called, What an Amazing Salvation. And so today I want to do What Amazing Salvation Part do part two all right uh, so so I started last week's message you might remember I talked about um, something that we take for granted what is it that you take for granted what is it last week I talked about hot water hello if, if there's no hot water at the Miller home people are not happy amen is that the same thing for your life and your your wife uh, and your family <laughs> it's exact I, I was thinking about something else what else how about this one how about our health I mean, you, even the most healthy among us, I mean, the most aerobicized, jazzercised, is, is there even jazzercise? I don't even know. The, the most um, uh, P90, XYZ, PDQ, whatever it is, the most exercised person in this room, you still don't completely know what a blessing your health is until something happens. You know what I'm saying? This past January, I had the whole gallbladder thing. This church is blessed. I'm, I'm their only pastor who's ever preached without a gallbladder. It's a real honor to fill that position. But, um, yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't think nothing of it that Saturday night as I was eating the, the Essen House. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I was eating that, that baked steak. I was eating those mashed potatoes. I was eating those green beans and those noodles. Didn't think anything of it until about three hours later when I was like, oh. And I'm not saying it was their food. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but th- it was the, f- the fat content that got my gallbladder that ended up a week later putting me under the knife. I didn't even think anything about my health until y- you have to go through something like that, right? Well, think about that in terms of spiritually. This is my whole, e- even as we're in this Ephesians series, the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, we're preaching all the way through it, teaching all the way through it. One of the things that's really good gripping me as we move into this is that we understand who we are in Christ. That we understand who we are in Christ and what an amazing, great salvation we have. Because I think sometimes for those of us who have followed Christ for any length of time, we forget. We forget what an amazing Savior we have. What an amazing Redeemer we have. What He has actually done for us. And as the Holy Spirit began to inspire the Apostle Paul to begin to pen these words of Ephesians, he wrote it to that church of Ephesus, but it was meant to be passed around to all the churches. Insert your church name. It could have been written to the church of Middlebury, the church of Pathway. And before he went any further, he said, guys, before we go any, I'm going to tell you some really cool stuff. I'm going to teach you. The Holy Spirit's inspired me to write some really great stuff. But hold on. Just put, your, put, your, put, put it all aside right now. And, and he said, first, what we got to do is we got to praise Jesus. Look at verse 3. He says, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts from verse 3 all the way to 14, verse after verse after verse after verse, saying, Isn't this amazing? Isn't this great? Let's praise God for this. Let's praise God for this. Let's praise God for this. What was this? Well, last week I I shared four thises. Is that even a word? This is, I shared four thoughts. Today I want to share the other four, but just just as a reminder, remember this. Remember, look at verse 4. God chose us, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The second was, was um, uh, uh, he pre- uh, verse, look, look at verse 5. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. God chose us. God adopted us. I mean, just that alone is enough to think that God chose me even, in, in the, even while I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. And now, there, there may be some Calvinists among us. I was, I was listening to a preacher preach this week on the book of Ephesians. I've just been listening to a lot of different messages, studying a lot of different things. And, and this guy's a five-point Calvinist. And, and uh, it's something like, Calvinist, what does that mean? Calvin Klein, what are you talking about? I, maybe some other day we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into it. I don't have a lot of time. But um, we, we're really, uh, uh, I, I'm not a big Calvinist at all. But it was so interesting to hear him share the points about adoption and election uh, a lot differently than what, where we would go. Bottom line is this. I don't think the apostles 
Apostle Paul meant for Ephesians chapter 1 to be something that we debated about. I think all he did was, isn't this amazing? You have a reason to praise God because you've been chosen. He's adopted us. And that means something to me. I hope it does to you too. Let's just rejoice in it. Let's just, it's not so, not so helpful to debate about it. Let's just rejoice in the fact that we can't get past this fact no matter where you're at theologically. God has chosen us. He has adopted us. And he's poured out his grace on us. Ooh, he's poured out his grace. He's adopted us. Do you know all that means that, oh, we're going to get there, but I just got to jump the gun. Just everything we have in Christ. I had an uncle, his name was Emerson. Some people called him Barney because when he was younger, they, he always did a great interpretation of Barney Fife. Emerson Ropp, and, and uh, at about 15, 16 year old, uh, when I was 15, 16, he, he became my co-guardian with my sister Shane Kripe, and they were my co-guardians, and Emerson pretty much looked after all the financial stuff, and uh, I didn't even think anything of it, honestly, but all I knew is that he worked at First State Bank, downtown Goshen, and all I knew is if I w- walked into First State Bank as a 16, 17 year old teenage teenager, if I walked in that bank and I walked up to his secretary and said, is Emerson available? In just mere moments, the door would swing wide open and my Uncle Emerson, sometimes I'd even see people leave and just, he'd say, come on in, Scott, come on, sit down. And and it wasn't until years later that I understood, I don't even know what his official title was, but he was like the top dog at that branch. Uh, manager, vice president of something. I have no idea. But that was the branch that he oversaw. His office was like the office to sit in if you had to talk to the person about something important. And here I was just going in saying, could I have an extra 50 bucks? Uh, I'm, I've got a date and I want to take her to a movie and go to the Olive Garden. I mean, I, I'm just all these. And as, as I'm thinking about the adoption of Jesus Christ, Do you you see, like through Jesus, because we're in him, because we've been adopted by him, that we we can go straight into the throne room. My Uncle Emerson wasn't God by any way. He was a great guy. He's in heaven now. But listen, we we, we we don't have to go through any. We can just go straight in to the Holy of Holies today. Everyone who is in Christ, because we're chosen, we're adopted, and we're in through Jesus Christ, that gives us access to Almighty God. God, we don't have to go through any kind of a process of uh, uh, this person, this, no, we just go straight in to that, uh, that, God, this is how I'm feeling, this is where I'm at. It's because we're in Christ, we're chosen, we're adopted, and it's only through His grace. It's not because you're so good, it's not because you're so great, it's because He's so good and He's so great. And what He did for us on this cross when he died on that cross for our sins, when he rose again and conquered death. It's all because of that. He freely gave that to us. He freely gave us that forgiveness. Do you know that you're God's favorite? Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, you're God's favorite. Come on, right now. You're God's favorite. You, 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 Caleb, God's favorite. You're God's favorite. You're God's favorite. Well, Eric, pretty much. No, you, you are. You are. You're God's favorite. You, wait, 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 wait. I don't think God has favorites. No, he does. And here's the cool thing. We're all his favorites. I mean, just that's his grace. That's his grace. He's like, yeah, you're my favorite, and you're my favorite, and you're all my favorites. It's through his grace. It's not because of anything we've done, but it's all through him. Now, we don't take advantage of that grace, right? We don't take advantage of it in, in a bad way. It's like, oh, I'm just going to go sin how, and live however I want. And I know God will forgive me. No, that's taking advantage of it, and that's wrong, and that's sin, and there's issues that you have with that. But we, we believe God is so full of grace and love. And that's what verse 6, I've already read it. But to the praise of his glorious grace, the Apostle Paul saying, oh, man, he chose me, he adopted me, and now to the praise of his glorious grace. What a glorious grace. And then verse 7, check this out. In him we have redemption. Redemption. 
and it, it, it's through his blood. I love that the apostle Paul put it. It's because of what the apostle, what Jesus did for us on the cross when he shed his blood for us. That's how we are redeemed. In these times, we talked about it last week, they had um, slaves. They would go and conquer areas, and then they would take those people as slaves. And, but you could redeem those slaves. If you had enough money, you could, if you like this person, say, hey, I'm going to take you out of slavery. <clears throat> shell it out, and in today's money, it'd be somewhere around like thirty-some thousand dollars Yeah, I'll buy you out of slavery. I will, I will pay the price for you to be redeemed. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is pointing to. It's Jesus Christ paid the price so that you and I could be redeemed. It was through his blood. Ooh, that was good. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, chorus, Amazing Love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? What an amazing salvation we have. And the result of that redemption leads us to this. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Fill that in your notes, will you? Grab a pen. Grab your notes. Write that in there. If for no other reason than just to humor me. Forgiveness. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Those that Paul was writing to would have easily understood this from their Jewish background. In the Jewish calendar, there was this day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Leviticus chapter 16 lays out what this looks like. You don't have to turn there, I'll just tell you. After the high priest would sacrifice a bull for his own sins... Because let's just remember, anytime we read the Old Testament, we need to read it with the New Testament in mind. Now, don't miss what the Old Testament's saying. Don't miss the context, the story. But whenever you read the Old Testament, read it with the New Testament in mind. So this priest, he had to take care of his own sins before he could um, do any sacrifices on behalf of uh, all the nation of Israel. So he's like... I'm going to take care of my own sins. And there, without the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And, and so that bull was sacrificed, the shedding of blood for his sins. And then he was good. And then he called for two goats, and they bring in two goats. And one goat they would sacrifice again, but this time it was on behalf of the sin of all the nation. And, and they would find forgiveness through that. Now, uh, what was the sacrifice for all of us? It was Jesus, of course, right? So all of that was a foreshadowing, a foretelling of what was going to happen eventually in the New Testament through Jesus. And, and so took care of that, that, killed that first goat, and that was, that was sacrificed for the sins of the nation. And then there'd be a second goat. And the priest would do something real peculiar to this one. He'd take that goat and he'd place his hands on the head. And in, in essence, he would decree the sins of that nation and decree the sins of those people upon that goat. And that goat became known as the scapegoat. And what would happen then is that goat would be taken far outside of the camp into the, like the desert wilderness and it would be released. And that goat would never come back never be seen again, and never be heard again. Psalm 103 says, Our transgressions, our sins, are as far as the east is from the west. Take that and just bring it into, oh, just process that. Your sin, my sin, Jesus forgave it. And here's the good news about your sin and my sin. Once you come to Jesus and you, you repent of it and you ask for forgiveness, He grants that. And the Word of God says that sin's never going to come back again. It's never going to be seen again. It's never going to be heard of again. Why? Because you've been forgiven. Oh, well, there's consequences to sin. We know that. You might still have to deal with some of the consequences of your stupidity, my stupidity, because I sinned. But we know this. I stand forgiven before Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but that, that gets me pretty pumped when I think about Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Think about this. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the book of Ephesians. Be in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in. That whole thought is all throughout Ephesians. We're going to hear that over and over again. But in Romans it says there's no condemnation. If you're walking in condemnation because of sins that you've already brought to Jesus, and you say, God, please forgive me, just know this. The Word of God declares that you don't have to. He's given you forgiveness. He's given you freedom. Walk in that. Well, Scott, what about those of us who've prayed the prayer? We put our faith in Christ, but we're not perfect. Hey, that's all of us <laughs> that have prayed that prayer of salvation. What about our sin? What, what, what about the fact that I've asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins, but then I'm still messing up from time to time? I do. Th well, then you just take out the old spiritual scrub brush, you know, the soap, um, or or you just you, that was wasn't meant physically. Um, uh, First John one nine, you spiritually go to the Lord and say, God, I confess my sins again. I know you're faithful and you're just and you're you're going to forgive every single one of them. And that's why it's good. Every believer in this place, it's good on a regular basis to come to Jesus and say, Lord, search my heart. Is there anything in me? Let's make sure that I'm, I'm good with you. I, I don't want any sin to be getting in the way of our relationship because sin separates us from God, right? And so I don't want anything separating me. Jesus bestows. He gives us forgiveness, and that's reason to celebrate. The Apostle Paul's like, let's celebrate his forgiveness. And then he says this, let's celebrate, number six, the ESV says insight. I really like that version of the Bible. The NIV says understanding. Understanding, number six. Look at verse eight. In fact, I'm going to go back to verse seven. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. What it's saying is that when you and I come to Christ, he gave us wisdom, he gave us insight, and he gave us understanding. Who would ever thought that when we came to Christ, all of a sudden we would have a greater understanding of what the cross really means. You see, he's wanting you and desires to help you understand the love he has for you. He wants you to understand the joy you can have in Christ. He wants you to understand uh, the peace you can have in Christ. Yesterday I did a, just a real brief funeral for a family. It was a, just a tragic situation all around. And I, I, there's, there, are time, there are very few times where I'm speechless, you know. <laughs> but I'm just, like, I'm just like, God, you just give me something. And I, I went all the way through my funeral message, and I, I don't think it was bad by any means. And I just shared whatever. And finally, I just put that aside. I was like, okay, I'm just going to level with you. I, I've got, in, in essence, I said, I've got nothing for you. Nothing other than the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. That's all I got. The hope that we have and the understanding I have that if you turn your life to Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus, that he can take even the ugliest, rottenest situations and work all things for his good. Listen, that's understanding that I only had since coming to Jesus. Some of you, you're like, Scott, I don't quite get everything in the word of God. I don't, hey, understand that but let's just make sure you take that first step because the first step to finding knowledge about Jesus and about God is surrender your life to Christ Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him but God has revealed it to us by his spirit when you and I give our lives to Christ we have a reason to rejoice because there is understanding there is biblical godly knowledge that now we can grasp and understand think about all the things that God's given us insight in through his word husbands how can you love your wife better it's right here Wives, how can you love your husbands better? It's right here. How can I be just free of the sin that I feel so guilty about? This will tell you. How can I love others more? This will tell you. Are, are there any thoughts about when people go through hard times and, and that God is faithful because I really need This will tell you. He's faithful. 
this right here. You have all the insight and wisdom we need in the word. Have you opened your heart to receive Jesus? Have you? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Because I know there's some of you here, you're like, Scott, been there, done that, tried that. And I checked out a long time ago. I tried Jesus, Scott. I tried doing the whole church thing, the whole Bible thing for a while. And I walked away. I was like, no, no thanks. Well, you know what? I've tried a lot of diets in my day. Why are you laughing? (laughs) There's one that really seemed to work, and I probably need to follow it some more. But, you know, I've done little things. I remember even college. I thought I was doing great because I was eating low fat. I mean, I was like, low-fat potato chips, low-fat pretzels. <laughs> Instead of Coke, I started drinking Dr. Pepper. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a, there's a lot of things I did. Just, uh, you know, every person who's ever tried to lose weight, you're exercising, you're doing, but then all of a sudden you're just like, yeah, I'm uh, fooling on this. I'm, I'm going to go get me a, a Twinkie or something. <laughs> just, anything, whoopie pie, something. Um, you know, some of you, that's, that's been your relationship with Jesus. The one season where I had success in losing weight was when I was determined that come, I don't care what happens, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to eat this way. I mean, I'd go to lunches and I'd be like, oh, man, i got to eat fish. Well, I like fish, but every day, you know, and I, I, oh, i got to eat this. I, gotta, I mean, very just really focused in that season and that some of you, your relationship with Jesus was kind of like the last time you dieted. It was like, oh, yes, I want Jesus. Oh, yeah, I want to lose weight. But you just didn't have any discipline to just to really dive. You, you gave it a chance for like a day or a week, and they're like, I'm not doing this. You, are you kidding me? Some of you, that's the way you took your relationship with Jesus. You turned and it's like, I, I tried Jesus. and Let me just encourage you. Try again. Dive in. Dive in and stay in. And let's just watch as you get plugged into a local church. If you don't have a church, don't look any further. Here's a church for you. If you have a local church, I know we have a lot of guests here today, then go stay faithful to that church. Get, get into the teaching that your pastor's bringing. Get into, if it's in your context, Sunday school, in our context, life groups, where you can grow and be discipled. And discuss it further and and dig down a little deeper. But stay committed to it. And you begin to watch as all of a sudden the things that didn't even make sense all of a sudden make sense. Or the things that never made sense, suddenly there's just a piece about it that, you know what, I don't have to have all the answers. God wants to give you understanding and he, He will. He wants to give you insight. And there's another word in verse 14 that I want to throw out to you. And that's this word, guaranteeing. Verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his God. Guaranteeing, guaranteeing. You know when you buy a house, you put down that earnest money or you put down a deposit. Let's just talk about the deposit. I mean, the the prayer is by the time you ever are ready to buy a house, you got a chunk of money that somehow, (laughs) someway, you can put down on that house. And what that says, that tells the mortgage company, that tells the bank, I'm serious about this. I, I, I'm putting some skin in the game. I could go buy this with that money. I could go do this with that money. I, but, you know, I'm taking this deposit, and I'm, in a sense, I'm guaranteeing you that I'm here. I'm not going to run on you, and you're not going to get stuck with my mortgage. What you're saying is I'm invested. I'm committed. And God's saying when you get saved, in fact, the Apostle Paul is just rejoicing in this. When you give your life to Christ, God gives you a guarantee through the Holy Spirit that, boom, you're one of mine. In fact, literally, if you don't understand this theologically, just know this. The moment you surrender your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence in your life. I don't want to lose you. I don't want you to think I'm do 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 But let me just tell you this. Ready for this? You're made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body. Now your body is this right here and that right there. It's pretty simple. Your soul, as I understand scripture, it points to this. Stuff like your heart, your will, your mind, your intellect, 
your emotions. All that's your soulless realm. But then there's your spirit. And the challenge is this, is we try to put stuff in that spirit realm of our life that can that place can only be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know some of you may not agree with me, but everything I see in, in the context of Scripture is this, is that you were created to serve God. So much so that there's a part of you that is what's created to house the Holy Spirit inside of you. You were created for that. And you can try to replace Jesus and put other things in that place, but I'm telling you, nothing will ever satisfy until you, you turn your life over to Jesus. And you say, come. You can have all the success in the world. You can get every degree. I was talking to somebody recently, going after their master's degree and going after their doctorate and going out and just thinking their PhD. And I'm just thinking, man, you guys are nuts. I'm thinking, good for you. Good for you. Good for you. Go back to school. <laughs> no, I, I just I struggle with that stuff sometimes. Here's, I don't struggle that they're doing it. I just struggle with myself, the thought of going on and getting further educated. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. You can get every, everything behind your name. You, you can get all that stuff. And you can try to have success in the world, whatever that looks like, all the money in the world. I'm going to tell you, it's never going to satisfy your spirit, man. It's always going to be empty. And so I want to encourage you with this. Receive this word of, of knowledge and insight today. Receive this today. And know this, that the Holy Spirit wants to come and reside inside of your spirit. You give him a chance. Through Jesus, right? Through what he did for us on the cross, through his grace. And what happens then is we have a guarantee, a guarantee, <laughs> like no other guarantees. Uh, my uh, kitchen trash can, who would have thought I'd be preaching on a trash can today? My kitchen trash can, it's got this cool little step. You step on it and the lid opens and, and then um, you can throw that. You don't have to touch the gross thing, you know. Not that anything in our house is gross. Don't tell my wife I said that. But um, you step on it and the lid pops up and... Well, uh, for about three months now, we've been stepping on it, and the lid just kind of goes, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it kind of has a mind of its own. <laughs> and it was broken, and, and so I, I ordered a, a new one just like that one because I liked it so well when it worked. Are you kidding me? And then one of the girls uh, reminded me, I think it was Tate, said, Dad, isn't it under warranty? Don't we have a guarantee on that? I was like, I think you're right. And so I called them up, and sure enough, Simple Human or whatever it's called, I could say, oh, yeah. And so they sent me a new part, and guarantee, they guaranteed it. It's, uh, okay, the guarantee you have of salvation and of eternity with Jesus and life here on, is, is nothing like the guarantee on my trash can. Because I'm telling you, there's nothing, nothing like having a spirit full of God's presence and God's spirit. It's, he, he says, when you get the Apostle Paul saying, come on, let's rejoice. Come on, let's praise God. Because there is, because there's a guarantee that you have of your salvation. And, and let's go to the last one. Inheritance. He chose you. He adopted you. He's given you grace, redemption, and forgiveness, insight, and understanding, and a guarantee through the Holy Spirit. And you and I have such a great inheritance <laughs> you say inheritance I'll take one of those uh, what, what, what is he talking about well I believe there's an inheritance we have as believers as followers of Christ here on earth and in eternity here on earth this is what I believe it looks like in fact I, I didn't even read it in, in the passage so Ephesians 1 14 who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those uh, who are God's possession to the praise of of his glory. What's our inheritance look like? Let me just tell you something. John 10, verse 10. John 10, 10 says, The thief comes, the enemy, the, Satan, he's real. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come, Jesus has come, that you may have life and have it to the full. And what that means is while you're here on earth, that you can have that full life. You can have the fullest life that is possible through Christ. Now, Scott, I'll sign up for that one because if Jesus is in it, then it must all be good. No, here's the deal. Even as you follow Jesus, there's still trials. 
there's still, there's still issues that you've got to face. We all know that. But then there's also those great victories and great. And so God says, listen, through him, through Jesus, we're going to have it all. And you're going to have this life, and you're going to have it to the full. You're going to experience it in the fullness. That's what God's desire is for you here. And even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as your heart is ripped out because someone who hurt you, walked away from you, turned from you, God says, you can still have a full life. Trust me in this. I can take all that, and I can work it for good. Will you just keep staying faithful? Keep following me, John 10.10. It's that full life. That's our inheritance as a follower of Christ. And then 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 speaks of this. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. One of the things you get when, when you get into heaven and into eternity is you get a body that's incorruptible, no weary bones, no broken bones, no uh, sciatic nerve, <laughs> uh, uh, no gallbladder issue, none of that. Because you get that glorified body, and the Bible speaks to that all throughout Scripture. It's going to be wonderful. Through His mercy, He's bringing us into 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Listen, we, we as, a, as a culture, we live so much for today that we forget what's ahead. And whatever's happening today is what affects all of our life. And so then if we had a great day, then we're like, woohoo! And if we had a horrible day or a horrible season of life, then we're like, oh, I, just, I don't know where God is. I'm not even sure I'm going to go to church today. And blah, blah, blah. And we're just, uh, Let's remember, saints, let's stay faithful whether we're up here or we're down here, because there is an inheritance like none other when we hit heaven, when we go to be with Jesus. You know, I, I can't wait to see my family who've passed on before me. And I can't wait to give my dad a big old hug and my mom a big old hug and see my grandparents on my dad's side. And I, can't, I, I can't wait to just go up to Moses and just have a little chat with him. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait to see the, the Peter from the New Testament, Simon Peter. I can't wait to go up and just say, Peter, what were you thinking? I mean, there's just a couple times where I, Peter just, I, I can't wait for that. But I can't wait to see my Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. The one who shed his blood for my sins. And, and just to join all the angelic hosts to say, holy, holy, holy. And so, Lord God Almighty, you say, Scott, that's a really cool fairy tale. Disney couldn't even come up with that one, though. Because it's not a fairy tale. It's truth because it's in the Word of God. Amen. That's the inheritance you have. That's the inheritance you have when you put your faith in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, For all the promises of God are yes and amen. Do you get all of Christ's power? Yes. Do you get joy? Yes. Do you get love? Yes. Do you know God? Yes. Will you see God? Yes. Yes, 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 and yes. This is his glorious inheritance in Christ. Paul says, to the praise of his glory, he did this. When he thought through all eight of these, he's chosen, he's adopted. We receive his grace, and therefore we have redemption. We have forgiveness. We have insight and understanding that guarantees our salvation. And we have such a great inheritance. You know what the apostle Paul did? When he thought through all that stuff, he's like, oh, we got to start right there. And he just, he starts the book of Ephesians with, with a worship service. <laughs> he starts the book of Ephesians with just a declaration of, God is good. Let's praise him for this. Let's thank him for this. This is all we have in Christ. It was meant less about a debate about what chosen and adoption and election all means. It was more about, aren't you glad that we're chosen and that Jesus chose us and chose me to follow him. That's what it was about. And I, I hope that your heart is there with me. And let, in fact, let me just throw this out to you. Let's say I had, let's say I had a mansion. And I was going to give you this mansion. 
And this mansion had, I mean, it had tennis courts, it had basketball courts, it had an Olympic-sized swimming pool that had a cover on it so you could, like, swim in the wintertime. I thought this illustration through, let me tell you. It came with a fully staff that was fully funded, and so people would wait on your hand and foot, and you'd never have to mow the lawn again. You'd never have to shovel snow. you never, I mean, it, it, rise and roll donuts just showed up magically. I was like, doo, 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 they just dropped out of the sky. I mean, I, I, whatever, I, you just, this was the most amazing opportunity. And if I had the keys to that house, and I dangled them out right here and said, the first one up here gets it. How many of you would probably come? I mean, you'd be like, plow, uh, you know, forget the whole gentle spirit thing. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you're leaping over chairs. You're jumping out. Of the, and you're going to come, and you're going to get that and be like, that's mine. <laughs> now, just think about this. The God of the universe, the God of the Bible, is offering us such a great salvation that it doesn't even compare to anything I just said. It doesn't even compare. You ever watch those shows, the tiny house or whatever? I don't know why I'm just intrigued by the idea of living in a, I don't want to live in a tiny house. But, but on God's radar, what he has to give us makes that thing look like a tinier, tiny house. And I just, I want to encourage you today. If you haven't put your faith in Christ, here's your chance. Right now, right here. In just a few moments, we're going to baptize people. And in fact, I'll just throw it out to you. It's a, it's a nice warm day. we got some extra towels here. I'm as serious as serious can be. If you, if you are ready to give your life to Christ and you want to be water baptized today with everyone else, I'll be glad to do it. Because this is the day of salvation today. Can I just talk to you? Just Everyone just look right here. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you never bowed the knee, said, Jesus I know I'm a sinner. I repent. I believe in you. I admit that I'm a sinner. Listen, there's a lot of people that believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, there's a lot of people probably in this room. I'm guessing the majority of you, no matter where you're at really in your connection with Jesus, you believe in him. Yeah, I, I think that there's something to that. But here's, here's what I think is the book of James says. Even, even Satan believes in that. So just knowing about God, knowing of God, knowing of Jesus, that's not enough. What it takes is you taking that step towards him and saying, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in you, Jesus. I confess all my sins. And the word says he's faithful and just to forgive everyone. I commit my life to following him. It's, it's that heartfelt prayer. And if that's you today, I want to pray for you right now. We